good morning on behalf of telemedicine society of india maharashtra chapter myself dr santosh bide consultant of telemologist from pune welcome you all for this webinar on tele ophthalmology today we are fortunate to have great speakers our first speaker is dr rahat hussain he is a senior consultant ophthalmologist glaucoma services from singapore national eye center after taking training of mbbs mrco and frco from london now he is working in singapore as a director of regional community eye care sing health singapore he has keen interest in glaucoma especially surgical part of glaucoma he is a director of regional eye system for sing health which oversees new models of care within the eye care healthcare system he has 60 publications in peer reviewed journals and he has 16 research studies the next speaker is dr k chandra shekhar he is a alumnus of bits pilani and iit kolkata he is a founder and ceo of forus health Forus Health, as we know, is working on mission of eradicating preventable blindness using technology. Forus Health has received almost eighteen point five million dollars funding for this project. The third speaker is Doyen of Ophthalmology, Professor S. Natarajan from Mumbai. He is a famous vitreo retina surgeon. He is a past president of All India Ophthalmological Society, Maharashtra Ophthalmological Society, Bombay Ophthalmological Association, and currently is president of Tele Ophthalmology Society of India. We also have as a panelist Professor B N R Subudi. He is a secretary of Tele Ophthalmology Society of India. He is a senior consultant from Odisha and alumnus of B J Medical College, Pune. and dr ratta he is a senior consultant at grand medical foundation ruby hall clinic pune and he is very active in telemedicine society of india he has been a past president of that association extremely enthusiastic and dr prachi sathe she is a senior intensivist from ruby hall clinic and she is a founder of intensive care unit at grand medical foundation ruby hall so i request dr rahat to start his presentation on telemedicine in glaucoma services in singapore dr rahat please um good morning everyone and thank you dr santosh for the kind introduction and i'd like to thank dr santosh and the committee for inviting me to talk this morning so i'm going to be talking specifically about um teleglaucoma and our experience in singapore which i appreciate may be different to the experience in india <clears throat> but um i can i can only share what <laughs> what what we what we know in singapore So let's start with some definitions, and this is how um, this is one definition I, I found of, of of telemedicine and teleglaucoma specifically is how we diagnose or monitor people with glaucoma or at increased risk of developing glaucoma without face to face consultations with a physician or a similar similar trained professional. So that's our sort of understanding of it. But we have to remember, of course, that the gold standard of care, particularly for diagnosis, has always been face to face. and teleglaucoma is not meant to match those standards however the question we have to ask if is such a high standard of care that face to face offers necessary for all our patients and you can argue in fact i am arguing that in a healthcare system with finite resources if a cheaper more convenient model of care can be developed so that an appropriate quality of care is available then that we must explore these models and that's what this talk is about so do is it what's the justification for teleglaucoma now ideally all patients see a senior glaucoma specialist such as myself on a face to face on a slip down that's the ideal but in 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 SNEC in Singapore National Eye Center 
we we see about a thousand patients a week in our glaucoma clinic now i appreciate that's probably small numbers compared to um some of your clinics in india but for us it's, it's a busy clinic and we just can't manage those numbers which are increasing year on year so we needed to really design a system whereby hopefully everyone is managed safely and appropriate to the severity of the disease um and the first question we asked is, is, is glaucoma suitable for telemedicine? And I think, you know, medical retina certainly is one of those specialties where tele telemedicine has really taken off. Um, and glaucoma is a little bit lagging behind. Um, but what, the way we regarded it is that we thought, well, what's the most important question that as a glaucomatologist we need to, to answer? And, and that is, is the patient's disease, specifically glaucoma, deteriorating? And nowadays, of course, we are almost entirely reliant on visual fields and or OCT scans, as well as, of course, VA and IOP. And it occurred to us that actually these do not require a face to face consultation. And in any case, even if it is a face to face consultation, these things are done anyway. So if we were to develop a model in which case in which visual fields or OCTs, VA and IOP were done, it would not require any extra tests to be performed. So the answer to the question is, yes, glaucoma is suitable for telemedicine. And we, we, we listed down a few key concepts that our teleglaucoma model would need to, to, to address. And firstly is what type of individual is a model designed for? In other words, is it for screening? Is it for glaucoma suspects? Or is it for patients with established glaucoma? And of course it can be all three, but maybe tweaks to those models would be needed. What data would be needed? Well, I've sort of answered that before in IOP, VA, HVF, maybe OCT, and maybe even fundus images or anterior segment images as well. How will, where will these data be obtained? Now, um, in Singapore, we're trying to um, uh, get as many tests done or, or patients seen in the community setting rather than in the hospital setting for various reasons. Um, and so that's where that's what we felt that was important. And of course, what are the personnel involved, both in the, the acquiring the data as well as making those management decisions? And we were fairly clear from the beginning that we wanted ophthalmologists to remain the people in charge of making the management decisions. But in terms of the people who uh, acquire the data, for example, the HVF or the OCT, um, it could be nurses, optometrists, uh, technicians, even perhaps patients themselves. And of course, nowadays, we also have to be ensure that data are saved, uh, safely stored and transmitted. And so we had to think about how we're going to um, um, uh, transmit data. Of course, when we designed a model, we, need to, we needed to show that it was safe, cost effective, importantly, and acceptable to both the patients as well as the uh, healthcare staff. Um, and, and, um, and of course, we have to bear in mind that this model is not always going to be applicable to you know, all healthcare institutions or all, all populations, of course, it depends very much on the population profile and, and the uh, healthcare infrastructure. It, implementing such models um, is, has proven to be quite difficult in actual fact. And, and I think one of the things we need to understand when we implement any model is an understanding of risk. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, of course, we all know that glaucoma is a, is a serious disease and can lead to blindness, but Thankfully, the vast majority of patients with glaucoma do not go blind. And, you know, when we, when we were trying to implement this model, which I'll explain a, a bit later, um, we were finding that um, people were not adopting the model in the numbers that we were hoping. And we felt the reason for this is that um, particularly junior staff who are less experienced tend to have a, a skewed notion of uh, risk. In other words, they feel, you know, every patient has a risk of going blind and therefore we need to see them face to face. Now, of course, every patient does have a risk of going blind, but it's quantifying that risk and putting it in perspective. That's what these models need. And I often tell my juniors to, to think about this question when they're deciding whether to send a patient to a teleglaucoma model is what is the chance that this patient will go blind within their lifetime? Now, that chance will never be zero, of course. But if that chart, if that risk is relatively low, then alternative models to face to face need to be considered. Now, this is an interesting paper, which I always um, uh, uh, like to show. This was take this was from uh, 2014 from, from, from Moorfields Eye Hospital. And um, 
um, Institute uh, of, of um, Optometry and Vision Science at City University in, in the UK. And to, to cut a long story short, they, they modeled the risk of um, uh, people going blind with glaucoma within their lifetimes. This, this was a modeling study. And I've highlighted in red what their, their findings were. And th they found that more than 90% of people, patients predicted to progress to blindness had a mean deviation of worse than minus six decibels in at least one night presentation. So looking at it a different way is that if a patient is presenting with better than six decibels of mean deviation loss, they have a less than 10% chance of going to blind within their lifetime. And that, that gives you just a rough ballpark as, as to how, how to, how to um, understand risk of visual loss. And that helps you decide in which sort of models they need to go into. And so that's what I often tell my juniors. Now, COVID-19, in fact, we, we started this model before COVID-19, interestingly enough, for other reasons. But the COVID-19 pandemic really spurred us on because we needed to decongest our clinics because there were just, you know, risk of infection. And we also wanted to minimize ocular morbidity. In other words, we couldn't just defer everyone's uh, appointments uh, because, with that, you know, some people may go blind. So we had to think quickly how to do this decongest our clinics as well as minimizing ocular morbidity and that sort of spurred us on so what we did is we we broadly defined our patients into three broad groups the sort of milder cases the ocular hypertensions the mild stable glaucomas then at the other end you have these sort of unstable glaucomas here advanced glaucomas recent glaucoma surgery and and in the middle the, the sort of moderate ones as well as other pe pe people with other eye diseases such as diabetes or, or cataract of course, patients can switch between the two. You know, there's not a static thing. They can start off here and end up here. Um, but we broadly categorize our patients into these three groups. And what we did is we, we, we wanted to, 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 based on that sort of uh, stratification, we decided the model of care. So, for example, patients with severe disease, this is severe here, this is mild here, the quality of care needs to be very high. And these were patients we seen in our specialist ophthalmic clinics, They'd have a slit lamp examination and two-way communication between the patient and the doctor. In patients with slightly less severe disease, uh, the quality of care is slightly less to match the disease severity. And so we, we did this something we call VidCon or, or video consults, where the patients would get an investigation, a test done in the community. And we'd do a video call with the patient about a week later. So it would enable, again, two-way communication. So not quite as high quality care as here, but uh, not bad. And then in the uh, less severe cases, we would do virtual clinics. So they'd have the investigations, the, the visual field or whatever in the community. We would review the week's uh, notes a week later. And then we would write to the patient or, in fact, we're doing SMS now. But that's just a one way communication. We don't give the patient an opportunity to feed back to us unless they you know, contact the, the centre. And I'll be talking a little bit about this in a moment. I'll, I'll be showing you um, uh, uh, the model that we're using. And then finally, we're not quite here yet. Um, we are for our retina department, but not quite for us, but there's some sort of home monitoring app to monitor their condition and they communicate to the doctor if there's a problem. This is again, one way communication, but this time from the patient to the doctor. So this, this way we try to match the disease severity with the quality of care while still maintaining some degree of safety. So we called our, our virtual clinic the Glaucoma Observation Clinic, or GLOC for short. And this is what happened. So a patient will come to an IUC, and an IUC stands for an investigation unit in the community. Now, this is typically a standalone room or a, a building where, and it's staffed by generally ophthalmic technicians or a nurse. And it has a, um, um, uh, uh, a visual field machine and an OCT machine, sometimes a camera. Um, the, the nurse uh, has an eye care tonometer and the patient will come to this IUC and get the relevant tests. For example, visual acuity, um, uh, IOP and HVF, for example. The nurse or the technician will and ask them a very simple question. Any change since your last visit? In other words, any change in your vision, any change in, in, in anything you want to tell me since your last visit. And we deliberately wanted to keep that question quite broad and quite simple to allow the patient to feed back to the nurse anything they wanted to tell us. For example, they may say, yes, I'm getting my eyes are very itchy, or they may say my vision in the right eye is deteriorated or I'm getting pain, for example. And the nurse would then document the answer to this question in the 
electronic medical records and would get the appropriate test, the patient would then go home. No waiting to see the doctor. We, however, would then review the test results remotely as well as the what the nurse had written down to this question. We would make a management decision and inform the patient by SMS, for example, your condition is stable, continue with your eye drops, we'll see you in six months. And then we would send the eye drops out to the patient by courier, which is done free of charge at the moment in Singapore. They pay for the drops, of course, but the delivery is free at the moment. Um, however, we may also decide when we when we review the test remotely we, and we make a decision, we might decide we need to have a quick conversation with the patient. For example, if the patient said their eyes are itchy, uh, we may want to you know, uh, call them and say, look, how itchy is it? Is it both eyes and is it related to the drops, you know, etc. So we may want to have a, a conversation. And this is done either by phone or by Zoom. And when the patient comes to the IUC, they're told um, information on how to set up Zoom so that if we need to communicate with them, we can. If they find that too difficult, we just make a simple phone call. So that's our virtual clinic model um, as it is at the moment, and we call it Glock. And these are the sort of investigations. They have an OCT or a visual field test done, usually one or the other, not both. Sometimes we do sort of uh, a posterior segment photo. This is an undilated photo, you can see very clear, um, and sometimes an anterior segment photo, depending if the doctor has requested it from the previous visit they'll get a visual acuity and a um, uh, IOP with using the eye care tonometer. And of course, all this data is inputted into the uh, patient's electronic medical records for us to review later. And here are some examples of the photos that we've taken. Here's a sort of just a broad, broad, broad outline of the anterior segment. It would certainly be able to pick up if there was any um, microbial keratitis, for example, or a hypopian. Here's an example of someone who's looking down. So if their patient had a, had, had a uh, glaucoma surgery, we might be able to see the bleb. Of course, we wouldn't be able to check if there's any leak. Um, so patients who are sort of within six months of glaucoma uh, surgery are not eligible for this. And here's a, a slip photograph. So our, our technicians are, are pretty experienced and get some really good images. And we sometimes get um, fundus photos. For example, if the patient is diabetic, we may want to get some fundus photos or if you wanted to look at the disc um, for any reason, we can request a fundus photo. And that's done on the visit prior to their attendance at the IUC. And the idea is that these photos really replace a slit lamp examination. But of course, they're not needed for every patient because it does incur costs. We do have guidelines as to which patients are suitable to send to our Glock clinic, but these are just guidelines. And generally, you can see here, they're generally relatively mild patients. So I have to say, I don't really observe these guidelines particularly. I, I just ask this question. I say, is seeing a patient face to face likely to change my management? And if the answer to that question is no, then I would send them to this virtual clinic. So at the moment in my clinic, I'm sending around about sort of 30 to even 50 percent of my patients for their next visit into the virtual clinic. Because in most cases, seeing the patient face to face is not likely to change my management. Now, these tend to be established cases. These are not new cases where you need to do a more thorough examination. So these are established ocular hypertension or glaucoma cases. I'm just going to show a video now um, and to, to, to show you how it sort of works in practice. This, this is a video we actually show to our patients as well. I hope this works. It's a three minute video. Hello Mrs Tan, I'm Dr Rahat from Singapore National Eye Centre. How are you today? Uh, we are good, thank you. Great, that, I understand Mrs Tan doesn't speak English so thanks very much um, for translating for her. Uh, you know, I've had a look at her notes on the computer here um, and I understand she's taking some drops, some glaucoma drops. Can she just tell me uh, how often is she taking them and into which eye? <laughs> Yes, she's putting the drops on the right eyes at night. Excellent, that's great. So, like I say, I've looked at the results here on the computer and I can see everything is stable. The pressure in the right eye is 12, which is very good. In the left eye, it's 14, which is also fine. Um, so, basically, her condition is stable. But is there anything that she wanted to tell me? Any problems she's having? <laughs> Yeah, 
Uh, she complained of um, occasionally right itchy eyes. Okay, the right eye. Well, I suspect that's the glaucoma drops. It's quite common to get a bit of itchy eye with the glaucoma drops. Um, let me just ask her, is she taking any lubricating eye drops? No. No, okay. Well, in that case, what I'll do is I'll give her some lubricating eye drops. That should help with the itchiness, okay? If it doesn't, or if it gets worse, please let us know, and then we can perhaps see her uh, again sooner. But otherwise, I wanted to continue with those glaucoma drops to the right eye at night. She's doing the correct thing. Take some lubricating drops, and uh, we'll see her in about six months. Now, we can deliver those drops to her, so she doesn't have to worry about picking them up. Um, does she need an MC? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll issue you an MC and then we'll send you a text message which you can show to your employer. Um, any other problems that she's having? Uh, how is her cataract in her left eyes? Okay, so I can see here, yes, she, you're absolutely right, she's got some cataract in her left eye, but... Okay, I, I'll just end it there. You, you get the idea of how, and, and the idea is that the patient would be at their home when they have that conversation. Um, we, we have published um, a, a paper last year, which just looked at this, and, and the conclusion was that it was time efficient, uh, cost saving and sustainable model of care. And it was well received by our patients when we, when we um, uh, asked them and it freed up conventional clinic time um, and reduced our patient load. So, so we have done this. Just to give you an idea of the patients that we've, ne we've seen, it did start off a little bit slow. Like I say, we started off before COVID and then it obviously took, took off at COVID and you know, we're halfway through the year and the numbers are reasonable, although not quite as high as I would have liked for reasons which I mentioned below. Um, uh, we, 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 when we looked at what happens to the patients in this virtual clinic, we, a, a, a small proportion we actually were able to discharge the majority were seen as quite stable and they continued in the virtual clinic and about 15% were thought to be unstable and brought back to the specialist outpatients clinic for a face-to-face -face examination for their next visit. Um, and when we looked at that 15%, the main reasons were uh, changes in the HVF or the OCTs and sometimes for high OOP and sometimes for visual acuity deterioration, most of which was due to cataract, refractive error and, and some of the other things here. Um, and so the overall rate of glaucoma progression in this virtual clinic was around about 3%, and we were able to sort of pick those up. We looked at safety. So what, what we did, we, we looked at, uh, there were two of us consultants where we looked independently at about 100 uh, consecutive um, Glock patients, and we identified which patients in which we disagreed with the management that the doctor had said. And actually, there were relatively mild cases. There were three that were not sent for a fundus check because they were diabetics, one that should have been discharged that wasn't, and one that uh, we thought should have been trialled off their medications but wasn't. So relatively mild, so nothing sight-threatening was missed. We also have a separate protocol for new patients, which in the interest of time I won't go through, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a good protocol. and It's actually managed to reduce our referrals to our um, glaucoma clinic by two-thirds. So that's certainly helped with our patient load. Um, of course, there are some risks with any teleglaucoma model. We might miss concurrent disease. So, for example, they may have a microbial keratitis that we don't that we would pick up if we had seen them face to face, but we would miss in the teleglaucoma model. Um, it's rare, um, and you know, we do ask the, the nurse does ask the patient, "Are you having any problems?" And hopefully, they would point out that their eye was red or painful. Um, patients may not like it, and that's certainly the case with some of our patients in Singapore. Though happily, the the percentage is quite low at the moment. We certainly do need to look at cost effectiveness, and it's, it's not a given that this will always be a more cost effective model. So we're looking at that in a bit more detail now, but preliminary studies show that it is cost effective. And of course, we do really need to maintain data safety. So if there's ever a data leak, this could really um, be a problem. So, we, so, so we're very careful about that. Of course, there are many benefits to the model. It reduces congestions in our clinics. It allows an appropriate standard of care, appropriate to the disease severity, and it allows us physicians even to work from home if necessary and carry out these virtual reviews from home, which was something that was very important during the COVID pandemic and of course may become necessary again. The future of teleglaucoma I think is collaborations with our community optometrists. So we're, we're looking at um, setting up these uh, uh, IUCs in um, community optometry so that the patient go to their local optometrist to get these tests done rather than having to come in, um, rather than having to come in to, 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 to a, a IUC. Um, 
home monitoring is another exciting area. So this is a, this is an app called All Eye, which was developed here in Singapore, which which which, which sort of allows the patient to check their own vision using their smartphone. And and we're looking at various other ways to take photographs of their eye using their smartphone. And even there's an app, I believe, looking at OCTs as well. So this is um, exciting development, which may make things even more convenient to patient. And finally, of course, AI, we're looking at using AI to help make some of those uh, management decisions in order to stratify patients again into sort of higher risk and lower risk um, and, and, and again, save on patient time and uh, healthcare staff time. So in summary, we need to understand that most people, luckily, with glaucoma do not go blind. And so we need to devise new models of care so that patients with mild disease are managed appropriately and safely. And some of these models have been used, some of these models, similar models rather, have been used for many years. Uh, and so we have, a, we, we, you know, we have good data to show that they're safe and they're useful. And using these models, of course, will allow us to spend more time looking after patients in our clinic who are increased risk of losing their sight so that we, we, we can see those kind of patients face to face. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Rahat, for an excellent presentation on uh, glaucoma screening by using telemedicine. I have two questions for you. One is regarding compliance of the patient, and second is medical legal aspects. So are there any medical legal implications uh, you foresee or maybe you have faced? Yeah, so, so we, we did get legal to look at this. So whenever we do a video consultation, for example, we have a list of questions we need to ask the patients. Um, I didn't show them in the interest of time, but they are things like, for example, we have to establish their their name and their um, identification number. They have to show that, show it, in fact, on the screen. We ask them, where are you now? So that if they were to collapse, for example, we know where they are so we could send the appropriate uh, health care. There's a few loopholes like that, but otherwise, legally, it's been okay. Um, so you said the, the the first question was planned, did you say? I, I didn't quite catch the first question. Compliance of the patient. Plans. For teleconsultation, are they yes. comfortable? Oh, I see. Yes, actually, interestingly, the majority are, in fact. And I think this is because the groundwork was laid before by the, from the government, who sort of promoted telemedicine as the way to go. And so, in a way, when we began to suggest this model, uh, already had the idea to have been implanted in the, in the in the Singapore population, if you like, from their government, um, to endorsing this sort of level of care. So um, somewhat to my surprise, it's been well accepted. Of course, there's always a few exceptions, you know, patients who demand. But, you know, I, I, I strongly believe that the decision into what model of care a patient goes into should be by us, the healthcare providers, rather than the patient, because they're not really in a position to see the whole health court healthcare economy. So we are. So we need to be the ones who really decide and not pander to the patient's needs, who understandably will always want to see a senior consultant face to face. You know, I would too, but obviously that's not sustainable. So I think you know we need to make those decisions. Yeah. Any possible errors which may occur. In the initial stages, there were more errors and later on, as you were doing more and more consultation, the errors got minimized. Any yeah. errors which you foresee? Yeah, well, we, we did actually have one case that um, came up. Um, it was a patient who um, had a um, visual field defect, which was suggestive of a, um, a brain a pituitary uh, tumor um, uh, and um, bitemporal, essentially, hemianopia. Um, and now this was missed on the on the telemedicine that the, the doctor who saw them missed this. And luckily, the patient came in anyway and was seen and was treated appropriately. Um, however, when we looked at this, I, I felt this was not a fault of the model. This was simply a fault of the doctor picking up that visual field death, which happens to all of us. In fact, I've done it myself before, in fact. Yes. So, you know, yeah. um, and if we had even seen that patient face to face, it's likely that doctor would have made the same mistake. So um, it's sometimes quite difficult to tease apart any problems that might occur naturally due to normal human error, as opposed to blaming the model. And so far, I'm pleased to say that there's been no specific case that we can attribute to the model itself. Feel that this model is going to be a future of glaucoma management. I think it has to be in Singapore. Yeah, yeah, because we just can't we can't cope with the numbers essentially. Um, so we, we you know it, it has to work, and it, I think the difficulty now is trying to make sure it does work, and that's that's a that's a marathon, not a sprint actually, and it and it, it involves a real culture change in the healthcare providers, um, and and that's the problem we're facing at the moment. Okay, thanks a lot, Doctor Rahat. Doctor Bide, uh, may I ask yes. a question? 
yeah yeah please please yeah uh, dr rahat fantastic lecture very very interesting i am dr mankar i am the founder of doorstep health services and we provide primary care which is telemedicine enabled in the community i have seven clinics in very rural parts of india and i am very very enthused to see this kind of a model where maybe we could run an ophthal clinic where the uh, where we can uh, sort of you know um, screen patients for glaucoma and so on but i was looking at all the equipment and it looked pretty static and not portable and fairly expensive would you say something about uh, that part of it like can we move the equipment around is there such equipment available which is portable yes yeah, so, so um, i think it's a, it's a, it's a good question i think and um, we do actually have a i bus which has this equipment which can move around in fact however um is in singapore as opposed to india which is a much bigger place and rural communities hard to reach in singapore it's not such an issue the you know the 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 transport infrastructure in singapore is really very good and so patients coming to a fixed location where uh, you have a an oct scan which is in an air conditioned room so that you can maintain it well is actually not that difficult now so that that's why i started off that lecture by saying that you know this model is not appropriate for all you know populations and and healthcare infrastructures so for india i suspect it may not be so relevant apart unless you're in a city perhaps you know so so it's very specific to singapore but i do take your point and and the expensive equipment is also very relevant because we need to look a little bit more carefully to the cost effectiveness and make sure that we're not actually producing a more uh, a, a costly model yeah thank you thank you so much thank you very much uh, santosh can i answer uh, yes sir yes sir uh, i had an excellent uh, talk and i think uh, i work with the, the retna guys in snec right. so i know they are yes. doing a lot of uh, telemedicine for diabetic retinopathy screening so mm -hmm. dr mankar i want to say that uh, we had the first model thanks to kc in uh, 2014 we have we carry his uh, forus camera on the motorbike so that's a portable uh, and we can take it in the motorbike so you can he's made a box and uh, uh, you know also he's making some more equipment which can be put yeah. which probably he will send the new one amazing and, yeah that's interesting i must get yeah. in touch uh, he's there yeah. uh, regarding cost also K. now dr kc will tell us about costing and yeah that's a chance sekar is the the, the ceo yeah. of uh, forus and forest company has come out with for both glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy screening on a mobile model with the ai but i have seen that forest uh, equipment yeah. it's not exactly portable because a you have to take it it's fairly heavy and you have to rest the chin the chin rest which it requires you need to fix it inside the patient's house if i were to take it home so to that extent it's not portable Okay, maybe Casey can answer. <laughs> okay, one Casey for his talk. Thank I'll you, Rahat, for you. the wonderful. I, I have a question, Mr. Rahat. Yes, Dr. Rahat. Yes. Yes. Do you do you combine the glaucoma and the DR screening simultaneously? Same uh, thing? Can we? Yes, but good question. So, so we 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 it's quite complicated actually. But the short answer is yes. but it depends on how bad the glaucoma is and how bad the diabetic retinopathy is so we do have a model where you can do a virtual ret retina uh, you know diabetic screen and a virtual glaucoma but we have flexibility that allows us to change between the different models depending on the severity of each condition yeah so we we have a sort of protocol and a and a, a, a sort of um xy thing where you can sort of match it and it tells you wh which model to send it to yeah so but that that's a common scenario as as you as you point out Yeah, but in our, in our country india if the person the optom or ophthalmic assistant goes to the village he can do both the simultaneously both the mm. dr screening and the glaucoma screening so can save time yes it's yes economic also yeah so yeah, we 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 certainly okay. can but again it is about cost really because of course not everyone will need that in and not everyone will need diabetic screening so we pick the ones that need it and get the appropriate test done for those but so it's not it's not a blanket test for everyone we we sort of pick and choose because the patients have to pay you see for every test yeah 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 okay so over to you kesi yeah okay 
So uh, thank you everyone for uh, giving me this opportunity and probably uh, thanks to Dr. Rahat for setting the um, you know context and probably I'm going to present a few things which are uh, uh, connected to what Dr. Rahat said and probably in the process answer a few questions of Dr. Suchitra. So, so I am uh, trying to generalize on um, looking at many aspects, um, looking at multiple screenings. So there's also uh, Dr. Subhadi asked this question, like, can you not do two together or three together? So um, my take on the whole thing is to look at how do we uh, take a digital platform approach uh, to high volume community eye screening. So uh, it's going to probably answer a few questions, one on cost effectiveness, uh, one on multiple, uh, uh, you know, disease patterns uh, being man uh, managed, and then third on compliance. So that's the overall objective I'm trying to kind of uh, bring in in the platform approach. Now, this um, obviously, um, you know, I don't have to put this slide for doctors. The reason specifically I'm putting this uh, is to say that you know, these have become subspecialities and, uh, you know, uh, uh, doctor managing the retinopathy and doctor managing refractive, uh, optom managing refractive errors or doctor managing macular degeneration or cataract or ROP is different. So um, can we build a single system uh, which can be modular and based on the speciality uh, can actually be tailor-made for that? But at the same time, can be comprehensive. So we don't have to have different systems for different things. Uh, it can be if a doctor is doing only retina, then it will be, uh, you know, you kind of custom make it for retina. But if he's going to do comprehensive eye examination, then you do comprehensive eye examination. So, uh, so this is the approach, uh, what we thought we will do. And obviously, the reason for this is, uh, the skewed doctor patient ratio uh, all over the world. So uh, we feel that uh, we have to take this at primary care and ensure uh, the doctor, whether it is primary care or at the optom or even at a pharmacy, uh, where can become the touch points both for a first level screening or a, a second level management. So uh, we felt that this is an approach given that we need to scale and we need to see large sections of people in a cost effective manner without diluting the quality of care is, is, is the approach what we thought will be making sense. So when, when we start of the problem, so I'm looking at preventable blindness in total, and we look at three major things, at least from an Indian context. So one is less number of ophthalmologists. Uh, second is, uh, you know, expensive devices. And third, more importantly, is the less awareness about eye problems, right? Uh, the biggest problem I see, a lot of people ask this question. So what is one thing uh, if that can change will help you scale your business? I think one thing which can help us change our business is awareness, uh, public awareness, right? So the more public uh, are aware about their problems, they voluntarily will take certain activities, uh, which will not only help themselves, but also help the doctors. Uh, it will also bring down the burden of uh, you know, economy uh, when, when they're actually working because they can go blind. So when we look at how do you build this model? So th the basic thing is it has to have um, right from day one, a scalability, right from day one, cost effectiveness, and right from day one, the business models have to be correct in order to scale these kind of activity. So if you take uh, a user as a specialist, and the specialist can be a retina specialist, can be a cataract, can be a glaucoma specialist. So when you the user is, uh, you know, a doctor in his per personal clinic, so somebody like us actually go and make an offering, which is a device. So the doctor buys a device because it is useful to him. Uh, he can actually make a diagnosis. Now, the business model is very straightforward. It is a capital equipment kind of a sale. And the business strategy is at least in India, we try to do this directly. Now, when we decide to go from a specialist to a generalist, so from, let's say, a retina doctor to a general ophthalmologist, two things happen. One, the affordability as well as the access increases 10 times, 2,000 retina doctors to 20,000 ophthalmologists. But then you'll have to tweak the offering. The offering cannot be just a device because the general ophthalmologist want to connect to a retina doctor over a cloud. So it can initially, it was a peer-to-peer -peer kind of a connection. 
and the business model still is direct sales because a uh, 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 you know an ophthalmologist generally used to buying devices so he knows is the return on investment so he buys a device and then the business model primarily is using let's say a direct sale and a, a, a distribution kind of a model but then when you take it to primary care so suddenly you are talking about 500000 primary care so that means the access and affordability can multiply 25 times right here you cannot have just a device so you need to have a platform and i will explain what is a platform because uh, that will give a very good sense of what uh, it will help and then obviously the platform also consists of an uh, ai and then you can also have a specific app for consulting with the specialist right so because when you are screening at primary care it is only screening but then treatment uh, or even before treatment when the patient wants to know that whether he should come to uh, to the doctor for treatment or not uh, these kind of applications can be very very useful now the business model changes from selling of devices to subscription because in a general physicians uh, primary care clinic uh, you don't sell devices you actually sell subscription and so it is on a per patient basis rather than on uh you know on a capital equipment sale basis and then obviously the strategy is to start using partners who will be like minded it could be a service provider uh, like dr suchitra or it could be a pharmacy it could be anybody who actually has access uh, to patients who who actually get patients coming to them because end of the day we have to make it convenient for them right and uh, that is how we will as, uh, achieve cost effectiveness and then finally can we reach the consumer themselves right now this is a, a much broader question and when we have to do this we may have to integrate a couple of things like spectacles or hospital connections you'll have to tell them which uh, hospitals are available nearby so that they take a call and go themselves and then this is possible um, where you can uh, you know do subscription based selling and sometimes uh, in my experience i have found stand alone retina uh, retina uh, screening or stand alone glaucoma screening uh, is not scalable because even at 2 300 rupees it is uh, people find it difficult but when you integrate it with uh, spectacles uh, then you can kind of uh, subsidize the retina screening whereas you know a patient is buying a product uh, which is he or she so whatever little margin you make on that you kind of subsidize the retina screening and in the process you are ensuring that he or she is screened so the way to reach these consumers could be uh, home screening it could be at a corporate it could be at manufacturing uh, it could be at anything so it you introduce this concept have all of this uh, and answering dr suchitra's question making these devices much more um, effective much more portable and uh, you know what we have also done is we have created a lot of products in the process so the what you have seen as a desktop versus now there are several things which have got added so i think this approach when we take and then in this whole process we build a hygiene where the entire platform is uh, cyber security cleared hipaa compliant gdpr compliant so we take care of all the uh, issues which are connected to data privacy and data security right so this is i thought an approach like this will help us to scale and we have seen it in our own um, experience that we are able to scale from almost like 200000 screenings last year uh, when we do the last mile ourselves now what do i mean by a platform so one important thing is uh, you know uh, we make devices so obviously the initial focus was um, you know we get very very uh, passionate about our own products but when you decide to go into a platform kind of an approach you have to not only integrate your own devices but you have to integrate complementing or for that matter even competing devices so even though we make fundus cameras and kind of compete with topcon or nikon we have integrated their products also so it is not about because if a hospital has already got a product we don't want to waste it we want them to reuse it much more effectively so the first thing of the platform is connected devices and these connected devices will actually have different applications in different so when it is in a hospital it will have a different style when it is in let's say a rural clinic it can be a little more portable but uh, you know one important point which i always feel is that uh, some of these portable devices especially in the retina 
um if you're doing for the first uh, first time screening i always believe especially with old patients it is always good to have that with a chin rest and all that because that is when you get cooperative patient so we have created a product which will actually be integrated single where you can go and put it on a kitchen sink and take an image without compromising not making it handled right the second thing is actually integrating tele ophthalmology which is it could be tele retinal imaging it could be tele glaucoma it could be anything which will have an audio video connection so it you don't have to have multiple platforms have a single platform there are many doctors so it can be used where a common man where you put it in a corporate and many doctors are in the uh, in the platform this can be tailor made for a hospital which is using its own vision centers with its own doctors so you don't need to run multiple platform the same platform runs and because they are modularly built you can separate between when you're doing it for a hospital which is you know running their own vision centers versus where it is running on a corporate kind of an environment then of course the second module consists of the basic hygiene factors like digital payment gateway collecting patient data electronic medical records we have kind of built uh, in the final stages of having a full stack optometry also uh, uh, for the reason what uh, we also felt the same problem because most of the um, conventional optometries are finding it very difficult to kind of scale uh, with increased rentals increased uh, cost of uh, inventory so what we have tried to do is actually have a handheld um so for uh, for uh, for refraction obviously handheld is okay uh, so we have a handheld uh, refractometer which is far more accurate than the conventional one then we have a wearable foropter which we have created which can actually help uh, you know like in india you can send this device by dunzo and then an optom can be from somewhere and then he can actually get it on to your screen and change your power sitting somewhere so the device can be uh, the wearable foropter doesn't use any um, variable lenses it has a couple of only two lenses and you can sit in delhi and kind of in deep orissa change uh, the subjective power and in case an optom is not there we have the tele optometry platform the moment he selects a spectacle then we have the overlaying software which will actually show on different frames which are available uh, to uh, to see what will suit him and then we also use the same ai ml model to actually look at all the measurements so whether it is an interpupillary distance the nose bridge width the planet optic tilt all of these things we do right uh, so that uh, also is so if a hospital is not doing anything in optometry they don't have to have this but this is going only to an optometry clinic they can have this and then later on if they decide they can add fundus or uh, oct now and the last piece obviously is uh, artificial intelligence and then these are also connected to the outside the ecosystem one is the tele eye which we exclusively made for ophthalmologists for consulting between their patients audio video consulting and then it can connect to multiple spectacle vendors we don't make spectacle so we connect to any spectacle vendor they can decide whom they want to buy and this is just to give you uh, uh, you know probably one of the largest tele ophthal projects in the world i would say uh, which we did for andhra pradesh where we supplied both the hardware and software apollo front ended this so about 115 community health centers are connected real time and you can you can see we have done like 2.15 million screenings 720000 fundus checks uh, 1.6 million spectacles delivered and out of the 720 about 114 have been identified with problem so you know this is this you can track it uh, this is available uh, anybody can actually look at it and you can drill down and see uh, in which community health center in which uh, let's say if you are looking at uh, a particular uh, chc within the district you can go down and you will know in which district so many uh, refractive errors were there or so many cataracts were there or so many uh, retinopathy was there so the government can actually provide the last mile now the same thing can be done uh, where we don't have to run it with the government we can run it with let's say corporates where we can put this and this connected to multiple doctors and whichever doctor is nearby the patient can go there for treatment so we don't have any bias we keep it very open the patient decides whom they want to go so if they we tell them that around your region 100 kilometers radius these are the 10 hospitals you decide where you want to go so makes it very very agnostic makes makes it very very open the only thing we'll have to ensure is whether they went or not of course i'm not saying that we have solved that but we are slowly getting there right um i also want to bring and uh, uh, professor uh, uh, hasan talk about it so when you 
when you are screening high volume so we you reach so the initial approach was i want to identify who are potentially having an issue now once you do that and let's hypothetically imagine that we screen all the 6 billion or 8 billion in this world that is going to leave with us about 80 million people uh, who have chronic diseases various chronic diseases and now these people uh, how do you manage them because these are far more vulnerable than the 6 7 billion but how are you going to manage them because their behaviors are very very different so that is where we thought a con- a part of the whole thing could be a continuous disease management and the disease management basically is more or less what a uh, professor said before but it is one single platform connecting multiple doctors without sharing data between them right so it is like if dr subudhi has 100 diabetic retinopathy patients he will use this platform connect to them and then we will go or initially to prove we will go but later on these um, uh, these devices will be available in a nearby optical store or a primary care center so they will go there take the image ai will actually say that what is the change between their previous image and the current one and then professor subuddhi will uh, consult them on audio video and if he feels that there has been a deterioration of course it will also have some of these qualitative data and once that is there uh, then he can either continue the service after 6 months or he can actually immediately call him now this is again a monetized kind of a model so this will this will be a subscription between the patient and dr subuddhi so there is a revenue there is of course some will be shared for us going and or whoever is sharing the imaging but then it is it will be lower than the cost of conveyance and the convenience what the patient has to go through uh, to come to the hospital right and if they can come so again there is no compulsion you can ensure if you are if you want to go it is cheaper you want to see him good if you don't want to go this is the way the cost matching will be more or less the same so that it is actually a viable and scalable model rather than just a one off model and this will be possible only because the entire thing has to be structured and you know multiple users use it and as we find problems or as we find more optimization it will be get more and more cost effective both for the provider as well as for the patient so again we can keep it for many diseases many diseases dr or dry eye or myopia myopia is also becoming a big problem or glaucoma or armd right and then this will ensure that the patient is at home right and the doctor actually kind of manages him at home exactly like the example what uh, professor uh, had shown but i think the best part of this is this will be a platform connecting multiple doctors so but for the individual doctor it look like if it is home but actually the infrastructure is spread so the cost variation so if professor subuddhi has to invest in this he'll probably spend 10 crores to do so that means he has to charge so much to the patient whereas when it is shared between thousands of ophthalmologists the cost of this becomes low so then it becomes viable or scalable for anybody now this will obviously mean that we have to so when we when we build devices we build devices for hospitals and then when we the same devices can go into primary care but then when we decide that we are going to go home then it will actually lead to certain new creation of new devices now i definitely want to separate this uh, between the first level screening because in the first level screening we want to rule out all the possibilities at least at a top level but whereas when he is a known patient the known patient obviously will be able to uh, uh, you know for convenience cooperate so it is easy for us to build products which will be miniaturized which will probably take a little more uh, time to you know you so for example in a high volume cam screening you will have to take retinal images in one minute whereas when i go to somebody's house i have the luxury of doing it in 5 minutes right he is not going to feel threatened so we can compromise on few things but not compromising on quality of care that is very important because these devices can be built which will whatever gaps are there can be closed uh, when when we find uh, you know when we are going for these home kind of screenings right and then this is the last slide so basically when you build this it actually opens up several monetization models and scale both right so um, nothing can be built on philanthropy so even if it is 5 rupees or 10 rupees i think that is required 
for sustainable growth for anyone right whether it is the provider or the hospital or the doctor so it gives it can be individual so you can run a tele optometry as a separate one you can do tele consulting as a separate one emr integration will be there disease management as a stand alone can be a, a, a product which there you can integrate it with spectacles you can go home give spectacles and then also do comprehensive eye examination and then it will also help in clinical services so the idea of doing this is when we build such a model we are able to uh, kind of use it across uh, the spectrum so it is not a uh, you know a platform just built for a government or a large hospital or an individual clinic or for only dr or only glaucoma or only oct it is built uh, across and then since it is modular you use uh, as you uh, you know you, you you pay as you use so it is easy that way to customize it and uh, make it uh, to reach the last mile so i thought uh, this is a very broad way of uh, you know providing the last mile care uh, whether it is at a uh, at a hospital or at a primary care or it is to continuously me, uh, meet your existing customers uh, at home manage their diseases irrespective of what problem it is and build a sustainable model which can be scaled and then of course there will be a lot of cross learnings which we can help each other to uh, kind of optimize and be much more cost effective and as we keep going obviously we can build it far more better um, you know whatever gaps we are seeing or whatever issues we are seeing we can kind of correct it over a period of time Thank you. Okay. Any questions for him, Professor Subudi? Uh, Mr. KC, uh, you gave a very good business model. Really, and we are happy. And in uh, during your talk, you mentioned my name also. I am very happy to be associated with this program. And our president is sitting with us, so definitely we look forward. But there are certain issues in our country. You know, uh, many times the people they do not come forward. the awareness is different the casualty you know most of the times the people are not aware they do not know that the diabetes retinopathy can lead to blindness or glaucoma can lead to blindness these are the issues second thing as you said ophthalmologists are very few in our country the number of doctors eye doctors practicing in the rural area is very very few so we can utilize the optometrists who are readily available even also as our president always tells they train people With the plus two pass or some tenth class pass, you can if you can train them to learn the devices used, they can go to the home home screening. As you said, also home screening is very important. No, go to the home and at a particular age of more than fifty years, we can do a screening for glaucoma, screening for the cataract, screening for the retina, everything. I mean, it is a, it is a comprehensive screening for all diseases. At least it becomes a cost effective, and I think uh, also it is useful to the patient. and you can help in the reduction of the national blindness so in this process definitely we look forward to mr kc to come with a device it should not be too much expensive you know it should be very handy so and easily sir, it, is easily, to, sir uh, it is going to be purely on subscription you don't have to spend up front it, it should be usually i mean um, easily handled by the people you know this uh, uh, health workers or like that so that's our aim So that's why, please, I think uh, come forward. We uh, wanted to you. Dosi welcomes you to our fold, and I think uh, we look forward to your contribution uh, coming years. Sir, Thank I, you, sir, I wanted to add one point uh, since you said this. See, one of the fundamental things which we are trying to do is the thirty to forty thousand optometrists who have been there uh, for the last fifty years practicing, and uh, if you uh, leave the ophthalmologists. they are actually the second uh, line of uh, you know uh, people who know little bit of eye so um, you know they are continuously being threatened by these new age companies which are actually having lot of money and uh, they are scaling so uh, one of the idea was to actually elevate them um, uh, by providing all the technology which individual companies are building uh, why don't we make this technology available to a variety of opti uh, optical stores across india and instead of they just doing refraction they will also do uh, comprehensive eye examination with a combination of things being available so the value of service what they will provide so people will go more for comprehensive rather than glamour so if that happens then 
we will be able to do a first level uh, screening and then they will be connected to an ophthalmologist for treatment and then the same uh, fraternity can be used for going and doing home screening and reporting to the ophthalmologist who who are managing them so that way we are building a, 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 a overall plan which will help uh, you know the society at large and bring down the cost at the same time serve a larger section of people yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, for the, i think you are also part of that thing we had a, a meeting with optometry so we can, we yes. called it as the yes. optometry the ophthalmology where we wanted the optometrist to see and then connect with the respective doctor and then do it some of we i tried personally we didn't work any anyway. good uh, all the best for you to do that i think that's required we, i think here we are trying to create uh, as subhuti mentioned about my, my idea we don't want to eliminate optometrists we optometrists can do and we have 1.3 Three uh, crore, uh, what do you call, a billion uh, million yeah. people. So I think we need optometrists. We need a uh, health worker. Uh, we, we need people who are uh, school dropouts. That's what I want to do with the uh, health care skill. But I think optometrists also are not uh, being used in India. And I think you, if you can do that, that would be great. Because yeah. ophthalmologists can do treatment. They don't have yeah. to do the screening. Now yeah. I mean, in a regular clinic, I think once upon a time. Maybe my father's time, they were actually coming for screening. They'll come for first biopsy, and now I think you can. No, there is no need to come to ophthalmologist. I mean, twenty-five thousand ophthalmologists, or maybe thirty thousand ophthalmologists can do cataract surgery or treat uh, the medical retina or whatever glaucoma, oculoplasty, and everybody can be uh, busy. And now no need to sit and do. I think uh, glasses, and uh, it's not uh, inferior, but I think without that, uh, the person cannot read or do the sharp. Uh, Uh, sight so i think uh, all have a role dr ratha has put his hand dr ratha yes. thank you uh, dr kesi it was an excellent presentation wonderful to hear you put it articulated very well and it really talks about a new telehealth tele ophthalmology blueprint you know what you have said and which i hope people get the message clearly and that is from 3000 bc till today we have been going in a pyramid manner from primary secondary tertiary etc whereas you have made a complete paradigm shift and you think change this triangle or pyramid from up down so if you have all your services on top at the community level where your optometrists your uh i clinic your uh, uh, people who are dispensing spectacles shops etc and the diagnostic whether they are in the kiosk whether they are in the virtual clinic and all that finally comes down to the gems of ophthalmology you are the very few people 20 or 1000 catering to 1.35 billion so your time your work life balance also needs attention and i think you brought this paradigm shift in a beautiful manner thank you thank you kes wonderful thank you now let's move on to the next talk by professor natarajan because uh, maybe we are short of time so no, thank you what thank you, you and thank you kes for a wonderful talk and i'm waiting for you to start that home visit that uh, <laughs> in mumbai which yes. uh, we will do it Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have learned a lot of things for us. Thank you for that. Thank you, sir. You can see my screen. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, uh, I think we had a wonderful talks by both Rahat and Dr. Casey. the i think i am speaking on diabetic retinopathy which the, the first thing uh, uh, first person helped me was a uh, kc coming based, uh, based approach and, uh, and based on that we have started working and then uh, they, we all know the global prevalence which is a uh, 450 million now going to in 2040 will be uh, the number is going to increase so it is a diabetic blindness it's a challenge and that's why i am making a movement from president as a president of all india i made a Uh, stop blindness screening through tele ophthalmology to prevent diabetic blindness it is an epidemic happening unfortunately every diabetes will be affected and not with eye but some some part of microangiopathy incurable disease and people uh, come only when they have symptoms and they are too late 
So according to me, prevention is better than cure, which is what we learned in social and preventive medicine in undergraduate, but we never respected that. But now I'm coming back as an aggressive treatment surgeon doing prevention. So we have, uh, according to the International Diabetic Federation, 77 million diabetics. In fact, uh, by 2030, it will become 101. And by 2045, 134 will be the capital. But unfortunately, nothing to be proud of. So I think we have to take action. We need not depend only on government. Government is doing a lot of things. We recommend primary checkup at the time of diagnosis in every person of diabetes. That means prevention is better than cure. So I suggest that we should uh, check the HbA1c for every person. Uh, and I know it's a little expensive, but if you buy in bulk, it will be cheaper and all, maybe you have to have some donation to support that. So I made this uh, uh, video. The President of All India Ophthalmic Society. I would like to thank. So I made this video to as a President of All India, along with the International Advertising Association, which was released in Cochin in 2019. It was screened. You can have a look. The International Advertising Agency are starting this uh, competition for uh, making a campaign on preventing diabetic blindness. And I also like to thank Alargan for the generous support to make this uh, public initiative movie to create awareness on diabetic retinopathy and how to prevent diabetic blindness. So I, I use this uh, screening through tele of the Are you a diabetic, hypertensive? Do you know you may go blind? So I think world over, this uh, teleophthalmology will help uh, diabetic patients because we can screen, diagnose and treat. But uh, teleophthalmology, we want only uh, actually screen and which that's what Dr. Subhuti mentioned. We can use anybody which I'll be showing you a, a video I, or I don't know whether I have it. So we actually do a pre-camp awareness assembly of diabetics. We only want to capture the images and then later it can be either diagnosed by an ophthalmologist or image grader at a reading center or using offline AI or online AI. So we have unfortunately a variety of diabetes, but uh, we need a multidisciplinary approach. But if you don't diagnose whether they are diabetic or not, and whether they have eye or not, eye problem or not, I think you can't help. So according to me, if you diagnose diabetes, it may be at the age of 30, 35. That means you do uh, HB when you see every year. And then uh, one year you find that uh, you are diabetic and then you can teach them diet, you can teach them exercise and maybe a, a simple oral antidiabetic that time. And then they can control sugar so that they can live long, live healthily and also have good vision. So uh, they may, all of us know this, but the problem is to detect that uh, as per the IDF, 58% of the, India, the population with their diabetes do not know they have diabetes and that's the problem. And we have a uh, one ophthalmologist per uh, 100,000 population. And there's no uh, low awareness or ignorance of uh, diabetic retinopathy. And 70% of Indian population reside in rural area or urban slums. And uh, they do not know that if you're a diabetic, they may go blind. And that's where, in a way, you have to create scare, but at least you can get them checked. And the other technical difficulty in India faces uh, unreliable internet coverage, deficit in supply of electricity in many areas shortage of trained medical staff for operate, operating conventional retina cameras and portability of conventional front of camera. So the, so the role of AI is a intelligence is the capacity to analyze, think, make a decision and categorize. That's a normal decision. But 
artificial intelligence involves formulating especially i mean what algorithm according to needs to develop this capacity and include it in electronic device like smartphones and uh, so this i use uh, uh, which is more uh, mobile as uh, dr um, uh, sujitra was asking so this is another one which is also heavy because you have to carry that infrared device and connect the uh, uh, this one and you also have a chinrest for this it can be counted on a, a mounted on a, a, a suitable bike for transporting and can be it can be chargeable so the phone and the infrared device is chargeable and i that's why i use coin anybody can screen diabetic retinopathy we have got about 30 staff and most of them are school dropouts and we have trained them to take retinal photographs so we have a, they just take the photograph they they know to do the blood test and they can take the photograph and after that we can use ai and then or you can use the ophthalmologist and uh, people to uh, use screen which is what we have published in jama ophthalmology and this is the uh, the uh, the not the forest one the remedio one any anyway, both i don't have any financial interest and i have both the cameras we use in the community so here this is a iphone attached to infrared device and they use a software called videos so they take the boy takes the image and puts it on the videos image and it will say whether it is 99% or 100% uh, uh, good image and then it picks up the abnormal color that's what uh, the ai will pick up that means it will show the there is a blue color which is marked which shows that uh, there is a area of retinopathy and then we also have made a software where it can be say that this patient needs referral that means referable diabetic retinopathy you can see the confidence is 99% so that way you you can know whether the fellow has taken a good photo or not and this is a, 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 a main point is awareness my my late father dr anasundra was sitting there with the tie he was always insisting that i should go and create awareness this is a, a school primary school in daravi where he made me teach them uh, what is diabetic retinopathy and teach them uh, to teach to tell them that uh, question answer the reason i asked him what's the point in teaching them diabetic awareness to this young people he said that their parents and their grandparents may have a diabetes and these children will go and ask them to do it you know it in a way it is the right thing so he said nobody should go blind just because they are having, they are unaware and i say that they should not go blind just because they don't have money so both we are matching in our foundation and i have them in their my parents name kamala sundaram foundation and the success of diabetic retinopathy program depends on capacity building by providing necessary human resources and equipment and the health facilities to carry out screening for diabetic retinopathy and eye disease the remedio and uh, forest by ksc they are making the instruments somebody has to give the funding and uh, thanks to ratan tata foundation who gave us the initial funding for doing the screening we are now doing continuously with the uh, the bombay municipal corporation and pediatric training of the healthcare staff on diabetes screening dia screening and management of diabetic retinopathy and other diseases and that's what we have taken the task so we also discussed with the shaf charity where we can go do the training and then we can get a certification from skill development corporation of india which is what we have made and dr subudhi is here i have to send him the mou which we made as a president of all india now we'll make it with the telio ophthalmic society of india so that any illiterate or not illiterate any a person who is a school dropout uh, can uh, even illiterate can be trained because most of them know to use the mobile phone and a smartphone and they can take retinal photograph so we and we, uh, we have trained and employed youth of india even with minimal education or no experience in retina camera to reach out to save vision of millions so this is what is my, my dream and that's what i'm actually doing tom tom from 2019 when i became president i know sometimes it looks like uh, deaf ears but i'm happy dr ratha is taking some pictures so i hope uh, people like him will and also kc will uh, spread this message so that i am actually want to promote every person who makes retina camera or anything to do with eye for the rural eye care because uh, all of us originally come from a rural india and uh, i'm happy doctor my grandfather was eye doctor who worked in uh, ganjam district where doctor uh, subudhi hails from so the idea is to uh, we can make a system without uh, electricity without internet better chat time this is what uh, doctor ratha commented that uh, ophthalmologist can use the time to do diagnosis and uh, treat rather than do screening so timely treatment will be preventing blindness 
So I request everybody, it's not only ophthalmologists, it, anybody should join for, for this uh, monumental revolution, fight against blindness from diabetes. And I thank uh, Santosh for organizing this. And I, I wish he could have also collaborated with the MOS. I know he's the incoming president. So I'm happy they're all our alumni and I'm sure they will con uh, continue doing this because diabetes is not a one-time camp or a one-time screening. They have to do lifelong. So thanks to my fellow Dr. Aishwari Ayer and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for a nice talk. And thanks again for joining us from Abu Dhabi. Yes, thank you. <laughs> May I speak? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I think uh, our president has already outlined uh, what we plan in the future up to see the teleprocessing of India. So, no doubt, we have got two industries uh, set up. So Mr. Casey came with the forest camera and also um, um, also remedy also with us. So, probably we look forward how we can reach the rural areas. Who are the people? That's also we are planning because recently we are having some training programs too um, under the banner of tele ophthalmology and eco, the dosi and eco programs. So we are planning the from next month onwards some training of the uh, trainers, grading, grading, how to grade the retinal images. Yes, yes. That's very, very good. Whether one should train them, so whether they can uh, do it in the, the referable case or non-referable case, and uh, how we can at least have a breakthrough. So Tosi okay. takes a lead and we request all of you to join together to, with us. So we can have some, some yeah. as our Tosi. president always says that, let us hope the next five years, we should have diabetic free, diabetic blindness free India. Yes. So Subhuti, we should also do the MOU with the Skill Development Corporation of India, Delhi. And you can have the, this training part can be also joined with them because in, during the COVID we decided to do online but now we can do physical everybody can come to many places and we can set up multiple training centers all over india and we can select great anybody initiative. and train yeah it's a great initiative yeah good so now i request uh, anmol can you just share your uh, video from entod anmol oh, sir, sure <coughs> Thank you. So on behalf of Maharashtra chapter of Telemedicine Society of India, I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Rahat from Singapore, Professor Natarajan and Dr. Casey uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving us um, excellent talks. I would also like to thank uh, Professor BNR Subuddhi and uh, Dr. Ratta uh, for being uh, experts. And I would also like to thank uh, Entod for providing us uh, with this uh, platform and all the, uh, the technical support. Without that, uh, this webinar would not have been possible. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you uh, viewers also for taking time on Sunday morning and attending this webinar. Thank you once again. See thank you. you. Thank you, Subhuti, and thank you. Thank you, Entod. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan. Thank Dr. you, Subhuti. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Dr. Ratha and Mr. KC, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a really nice talk. We look forward to again. Once again, we'll meet. Yes. Mr. KC will meet again once again. With Santosh, yeah, we are hopeful that we will meet very soon in the next few months with some more webinars. More interesting talks. Yes. These were excellent. And then we'll have some interesting ones. Yes. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Have a good day and happy Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Yes.